you know, you need to have something behind you. You need to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a, a motor mechanic or somebody who's run a business, uh, somebody's run a government department, so, and so on. And many of these people have got nothing other than a, a number of years' service as public representatives. I always wish them well. Uh, they must go and find, find a future for themselves. But I think they, most of these people are going to find that the grass isn't greener on the other side. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today, we have with us Ambassador Douglas Gibson, politician, diplomat, and attorney. Douglas has been a member of parliament for the Democratic Party. We served as chief whip. Douglas has also been the chairperson of the Federal Council of the Democratic Party. I believe a position now held by Ellen Ziller. Currently, he, he writes regularly for the Star, he serves on the DA Federal Le Legal Commission, and he has been the chairperson of the Board of Directors of City Power Johannesburg. And that's, that's the topic I want to start on. I don't know if that's necessarily something you want listed in your, your, your bio, but I definitely want to speak on that issue. Douglas, welcome. Thank you so much for making time to join us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure meeting you, Donald, and uh, talking to your viewers. Douglas, load shedding, load shedding, load shedding. I mean, we're now at stage six. Um, the president is now flying back. How worried should we be? What is your opinion on the state of electricity in South Africa? Well, the state is appalling, quite frankly. Um, as the chairperson of City Power, uh, uh, my company has to uh, cope with the results of the load shedding. Um, Eskom has no option but to introduce load shedding and then make the municipalities uh, cut off uh, for certain periods. And that's exactly what's happening. Now, a lot of people will blame City Power. City Power will, will of course, blame Eskom. Um, the uh, difficulty that South Africa has with Eskom is that it stuck a mile out many years ago, in 2008, if not long before that, that we were heading for major problems. And at the moment, we're getting to be like Zimbabwe with uh, no reliable source of electricity. You can't run a modern economy like that. Now, some people uh, overlook the fact that these were political decisions that were taken by the ANC government. The Mbeki government, in fact, uh, ignored the uh, warnings that were given that by 2007 or 2008, South Africa would run out of uh, capacity to generate the electricity we needed. And you must remember, when the ANC took over, Eskom was one of the most highly regarded energy companies in the world. Uh, it provided among the cheapest electricity, and it was certainly reliable and powerful. And that attracted business, it's attracted industry to our country. The ANC, as they've done in so many cases, is hardly an area of our national life that works. If, if there's one, I'd be glad if you'd uh, remind me about it. Um, but they, they decided to ignore these warnings and did not start uh, constructing and start uh, uh, um, making arrangements for the time where we would run out of energy. And as early as 2008, which is now 12, 14 years ago, we started with some load shedding. Um, they rushed into these enormous uh, coal-fired power stations um, and um, they managed then to make a mess of the building of those. The design was wrong, the execution was wrong, um, they weren't on time, and they're certainly not within budget. And the, the problem has just spiraled to the extent where Eskom now uh, owes over 400 billion rand. 
which you know, <laughs> I mean is an enormous amount of money, and it means that we haven't got the cash we need now to produce alternatives. The only possible solution at the moment is the one which uh, Eskom is allowed to, and which Johannesburg City Power is also pursuing diligently in a number of other places like Cape Town, and I believe Etequini as well. Uh, and that's independent power production mm. and uh, renewable energy. But doesn't but, that, Douglas, doesn't that mean the end of um, ESCOM if we, if we went that route? No, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the, the City Power's program will provide for about 600 megawatts. Uh, if it was producing 6,000, it would still not be our daily, uh, daily requirement. So uh, ESCOM wouldn't be put out of, out of power, okay. uh, put out of business. And they're, they're the ones who are really very keen also on encouraging um, IPP. Now, City Power is going ahead with, uh, with plans at the moment, and within about two months or so, we'll be advertising. We want, to, uh, we want people to come forward with, with uh, recommendations and uh, with uh, suggestions about what they're prepared to do. Um, obviously, it's got to be done honestly and openly and decently and uncorruptly because uh, that's been the problem in, in South Africa with every public works, uh, public works uh, effort. Uh, there seems to be a, a percentage of that which slides off into the hands of greedy officials or politicians uh, and uh, even greedy companies. And uh, so we've got to be careful about that. But it is a serious situation for us to be at uh, level six load shedding. I mean, we were visiting our, our son and uh, daughter-in-law and grandchildren yesterday, and um, he said that they'd had uh, four and a half hours without power in the morning. Mm. Then there were two and a half in the afternoon. Then there were going to be another, another two or something in the evening. That adds up to about 10 hours in a day. Yeah, it's madness. No power. It's madness. We can't carry on like that. Mm. And some of it's unscheduled. I mean, uh, never mind that which is scheduled. And some provinces like Eastern Cape, you don't even know if the electricity goes out. There's no schedule. And um, usually it goes out for six hours. But in some provinces, it just goes out for days. I mean, it's it's yeah. incredible. But uh, Douglas, so, can, yes, go ahead. Could I, could I just add that when load shedding happens, it creates other problems. For example... Um, Johannesburg Water is now suffering big problems because there's no electricity to work the pumps to, to generate the water. Um, secondly, we, um, as the uh, machines uh, uh, switch on and off, they're not designed for that. And they're doing that every couple of hours. Uh, it, it increases the wear and tear enormously and is inclined to cause fires. The, uh, the oil gets warm, hotter and hotter, and then ignites. Um, quite apart from that, the crooks use load shedding in order to go and do robberies. They use load shedding to go and cut down um, electric poles and to, to take away mini transformers. So it's not just a question of not having power. There's a whole knock-on effect, which is really very serious. And Douglas, do you think the situation can be reversed? Because I've spoken to some uh, people that work for ESCOM or who work in the renewable energy sector, and they say it's almost impossible to quickly reverse the situation or even to reverse the situation if you have, for example, a good government, uh, a coalition government. It's really we have a desperate situation that perhaps cannot be even reversed. Well, I'm the wrong person to you know, my former leader, Tony Leon, who was the leader of the opposition in South Africa, always used to uh, tease me and call me Pollyanna because, uh, you know, which can be an insult or it can be uh, a recognition that uh, uh, one's a person who always thinks that good things are likely to happen. 
Uh, I've been in, in politics and public life in South Africa since 1950, believe it or not. When I was eight years old, I told my father that I was going to parliament. And he said, why do you want to go to parliament? And I said, I want to go and fight the Nats. Now, they'd only been in power for two years then. And he looked at me and he said, oh, well, all right, well, then you'd better learn to speak Afrikaans. Uh, it never occurred to him to tell me to go and speak, uh, learn to speak Tswana or Zulu or Tlaza. Um, and uh, there it is. But I've always believed that South Africa would not go over the cliff. Uh, right through all the apartheid years and the difficult years uh, in politics for my party, uh, it was the PFP at that time, it had 1.7% of the votes in South Africa and uh, it looked as though the future was terribly bleak and that we were heading for racial war. And I always had a profound belief that we would be okay in the end. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if that uh, satisfies you and the viewers, but uh, I still remain an optimist. Uh, I hope that I'm going to be proved right in the uh, end. Douglas, isn't that to a certain degree the problem with South Africans that we have, we perhaps have this optimism that always drives us towards the cliff until we finally realize, okay, <laughs> now we have to find the solutions. You know, provided everybody does their duty, uh, everything will go right. And uh, that's what we need. We need proper government. We've had a government in power uh, for more than a generation now. And they are very poor administrators. Nothing that they run seems to work properly. And that doesn't matter whether it's a tiny town council uh, right up to the national government of South Africa. And it's such a pity because I think the people of South Africa are entitled to more than that. Some people are, are you know, very gloomy about the current South African position, the state of politics in South Africa. And up to a point, they're absolutely right. But, you know, there's certain things that are much better than they were. Um, our constitution gives all of us uh, dignity. It recognizes the quality of all of us. It recognizes uh, your right to be different, to hold a different view, to marry who you like, to love who you like, and so on. And uh, that, that's something very precious, and people shouldn't underestimate that. So in, in some respects, South Africa is a much better place. Where it's not much better is where there seem to be so many people who ignore the values of our constitution. Um, where we're supposed all to be equal, you get some people who are more equal than others. Now, some of that's because of the legacy of the past, but the other is because particularly of politicians who play one race off against the other. And the very people who criticize about race and about, for example, about black people not being advanced, those very people themselves, uh, could and should be taking steps to improve the situation. Just think of education. Why is it that a whole lot of the township schools are running on half full or half empty and the Model C schools, which cost a lot of money and many of which are very far away from the townships, they're all absolutely chock-a-block. And there's only one reason for that. It's because parents all, whether they're black or white or colored, Indian, whatever they are, they all want their children to have a better life and a better future and a better education. And the government's not providing that education. One of the reasons being that uh, the teachers um, uh, seem to run the show in many schools. Believe it or not, when they have a, a union meeting, they have that meeting during school time. And the kids sit and do nothing or play outside unsupervised while the teachers have their union meetings. <laughs> to me, it's just unthinkable. And in, in working towards making people equal or giving them an equal opportunity, which is what you need to do, 
The first thing is to try to do something about education. The second is to try to do something about the health system. Coming with this business of uh, national health uh, in, um, scheme that they're coming with, firstly, they can't run the hospitals properly uh, as they are. They now want to, to include all the private hospitals in the system, and they want to be able to run those and dictate what's going to happen. So where they've got a, a decent uh, health system for a section of the population and a lousy system for the rest, they're now going to substitute for that a lousy system for all of us. Um, I could go on. Mm. But, but <laughs> I don't think you, need, you don't need a rent for me. <laughs> But Douglas, the, the two of us might agree on the solutions like liberal values, uh, privatization of these entities. But yeah. do you think liberal values are popular in South Africa? I mean, it, it doesn't really look like you can sell this message. It's, it's difficult to sell the message of um, privatization or um, lowering taxes. It's, it's, is it popular? Is, is, can, for example, the Democratic Alliance run on these values and become... A 30, 40, or 50 percent party? Well, I don't know if you saw the um, public opinion survey, uh, which was published a week or so ago by Gareth von Unselen, um, which really was very interesting. Franz Cornier is involved in it as well. And uh, it uh, showed the levels of support in South Africa of the various political parties. The, this particular poll showed that the ANC in the next election might get to 50% or somewhere there, close to, to that. But that in the urban areas, the DA, that's the, all the urban areas in South Africa, the DA has now overtaken the ANC as the majority party or not the majority, as having more support than the ANC in those areas. Um, what that also means is that in the rural areas, the ANC is still reasonably strong. In the urban areas, it's losing support. Then, um, and then all the other parties were quite interesting. I mean, the, the new party, the uh, Action SA, uh, it showed they had about 6% uh, support in South Africa. The DA was up to 25% and it uh, looked as though it was growing. But the really interesting thing was the makeup of the support of each of the parties. And the ANC, for example, is now about 99% black. There hardly, there's hardly anybody who's white who supports uh, that party. And that should be something of concern for them. And the, the, it's happened because they seem not to be interested in the, in the uh, worries and the problems and the concerns of people who are not black. That's also a problem. Uh, but, but just Secondly, to play, sorry, uh, Douglas, just to play devil's advocate, why? Why should they be concerned if the majority of South Africa is black? Well, you know, if you believe in the values of the Constitution, South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. And you've got to try to unify them and uh, try to make everybody feel part of it. If you don't, what you're going to end up with is more and more and more people leaving the country. And the people who leave are not the uh, unemployed uh, uh, people on... Uh, EWP programs. It's the people who have got an education, the people who've, whose kids have got an education, the people who are paying a huge amount of income tax, uh, the people whose education has largely been funded by the taxpayer over the last 10, 15, 30 years. And there was a, a recent survey which showed that 53% of university people in South Africa were thinking of immigrating. No, I mean, that's terrible. And the, the country can't afford to lose them. But let me just get back to the figure about, about the support of the various racial groups of the parties. The big surprise one for a lot of people who like to dismiss the DA as a white party, uh, it's not. It's the most multiracial party in South Africa. 
In fact, its support is made up of 31% uh, white, uh, I think it was 32% black, 31% uh, colored, 7% Indian. There's no other party in South Africa that can compete or compare with that, not one. Not actually so. No, no, they, they support more than 50% of their support is white. So it's uh, what that's interesting. Really so, so you're saying that yeah. Action SA, um, it, it it has this brand. It's it's the party that's going to appeal to the black vote. But actually, according to polling, they have more white support than the Democratic Alliance, demographically wise. No, no, more of their support is white than the DA's white support. We've got far more white supporters than they've got because they're a total of 6% of South African voters, and we're 25% of South African voters. Just the proportion of their 6%, more than half is white, and uh, less than half is black. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, <laughs> they're multiracial, they're attracting a constituency and so on. But it, uh, it does put the, the matter into perspective, and it does prove uh, to me quite conclusively that the DA can claim that, firstly, it is the most non-racial or multiracial party in South Africa, and secondly, that its policies and its leadership can appeal to, uh, to voters right across the spect spectrum, and that's very important. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, um, it's interesting that the media doesn't pick up on that. And they always try to um, the, uh, tarnish the DA's image with one black leader leaving the party. But I mean, they never seem to focus on a, a leader of the EFF lead, leaving um, a parliament. I think the, the, EF, the EFF has like an incredible turnover rate in parliament. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a crazy amount of um, EFF parliamentarians that have left that party or have been booted out of that party. No, that's, uh, that's uh, absolutely correct. Just talking about the so-called flood of people who are leaving the party, it's in fact not so because our, the, the polls show that uh, we're increasing our support, not decreasing it. That's the first thing. Uh, if we've gone from 20% in the last election uh, to a possible 25% now, if the election was held now, that means we're growing, not getting smaller. Secondly, every now and then, somebody jumps ship. Now, some of them are friends of mine that I've known for donkey's years. Uh, some of them are, are, are good and are a loss. A number of them are hopeless and uh, I'm quite pleased to see the back of them and the interesting thing is that while it's not everybody that's uh, uh, involved and uh, I mean we're talking about a handful we're talking about 10 or a dozen people over I don't know how many years um, that uh, quite a number of those were facing disciplinary proceedings either for failing to do their jobs properly or for uh, all sorts of naughty things that uh, they shouldn't have been doing. So they jump before they get pushed. Um, and there's a surprising number of them who've lost internal party elections. You know, I want to be the Premier of Gauteng, say, uh, or the candidate for that. I don't get that. And uh, then I feel aggrieved. Or I want to be the Mayor of Pretoria. Or I want to be... You, the, the, the chairperson of the party. I want to be the leader of the party. And quite often you look at them and you think, well, they grossly overestimate their own importance uh, and their uh, abilities. You actually need, if you want to be in, uh, really useful in politics, um, you need to, to be intelligent. You need to have some experience. And just being a politician is not sufficient experience. You know, you need to have something behind you. You need to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a, a motor mechanic or somebody who's run a business, uh, somebody who's run a government department, so, and so on. And many of these people have got nothing other than a, a number of years' service as public representatives. 
I always wish them well. Uh, they must go and find find a future for themselves. But I think they most of these people are going to find that the grass isn't greener on the other side. And so, Douglas, um, I know the answer to this question, but you, because I've I've read your article, but um, you would probably disagree then with R. V. Johnson's assessment of a DA leadership crisis. And that, for example, that roadkill comment from John's DNA is a problem, a significant problem. Um, firstly, there's no leadership crisis. It, 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 that's not, you know, it's just a, it's gro a gross overstatement to suggest that there's a crisis. Um, I disagreed with uh, what uh, John DNA said. I, th I thought it was terrible, but uh, you know, I. In a political career where you are constantly talking, constantly making speeches, constantly appearing on, uh, um, on television programs, being interviewed by Donald Brown and others, it's actually quite easy to, to say something stupid. Yeah, and I know that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you at least cut it out, you see, because you look at it afterwards and you think, oh, well, Gibson made a fool of himself, but I'm not going to. And you cut out what you, what you said. Um, and uh, there it is. But to suggest that somebody, because he makes a, a stupid statement, that's really unacceptable. Um, to suggest that uh, he's got to leave public life or, or something like that, when he's such a talented person who does so well in Parliament and is leading the party to growth, to by-election victories. You might have seen in the last week or so, the, uh, the DA in the Karoo won a town council for control of a town council for the very first time. That's through a by-election where we virtually doubled our vote. Um, to suggest that that guy must now be thrown to the wolves is just nonsense. And that's what I said about, uh, about uh, Professor Johnson, whom I know and I like. Um, I've known him for 20, 30 years. Um, I think he was talking nonsense. And um, Douglas, Ellen Ziller, I believe you've said that um, she has reached the uh, political the, the end of her political lifespan it's time for her to move on do you still think that um do you still think isn't she overshadowing a person like john stenosen by continuing to be uh, holding that powerful position in the democratic alliance well you mentioned earlier that uh, i was the chairman of the federal council for in fact for quite a number of years uh when when tony leon was the leader and I used to act as uh, acting leader on many occasions when he was away or overseas or whatever. Um, Helen is, a, a, I've known her since she was 23 years old. And uh, without giving away secrets, I think she's, uh, she's over 70 now. So I've known her a hell of a long time. Um, in those days, she was a very cheeky reporter uh, in, the, in the public gallery in the Transvaal Provincial Council, where I served from 1970 onwards. I was an MP, MPC and leader of the opposition um, in the Transvaal. And uh, so I had a lot to do with her. And our paths have crossed through the years. Um, it's quite correct that about four or five years ago, I suggested that she should uh, get out, but she was then the, the uh, Premier of the Western Cape and she made controversial tweets and things, which I thought uh, um, did the party no good. Anyway, um, we were, she obviously didn't like my comments very much, and but uh, I think that she's doing a hell of a good job as Chairman of the Federal Council. And uh, so we're definitely on kissing terms, and uh, I like her. Uh, she's a unique politician in South Africa in that she says what she thinks. And, you know, uh, I was about to use a, a rude word. I won't use that. Uh, and there are very few people in public life 
who are as honest and straightforward as that. I also want to point out that uh, she's the sort of person who needs, a, like Margaret Thatcher, she needs about two or three hours sleep a night, and the rest of the time she's ready and raring to go. If you send her a, a message at uh, four o'clock in the morning, by ten past four, she'll be replying to you. Uh, so I think she she's, has a lot to offer. Uh, I don't think she's really overshadowing John. He's the, the one who leads in Parliament and uh, gets very good coverage there, uh, television coverage. He's very good on TV. And uh, so all I say is she was elected by a Congress consisting of several thousand delegates and uh, largely black, I might mention. And uh, so she's entitled to be there. When the next Congress comes, we'll see if she's opposed again. She was opposed last time, and uh, she won very convincingly. Douglas, what's very interesting is um, doing all of these interviews, I think we've done now close to 200 interviews with various politicians, members yes. of parliament. And at the end of these interviews, I always like to say, okay, we're off the record now. What do you really think of Ellen Ziller? And without mentioning all the names, the, the people I've asked us, they, they always almost say Helen Ziller is an extremely powerful figure. You don't cross her and she basically dominates the Democratic Alliance. It's she who calls the shots within the Democratic Alliance. Do you think that's the case? No, I don't think so. Certainly, uh, uh, as far as the organization is concerned, she probably does, but that's what she's there for. She's supposed to be running the organization. That's certainly what I did when, uh, when I was there. And uh, so there's nothing wrong with that. But she certainly doesn't call the shots when it comes to parliament. She's not a member of the parliamentary caucus. Um, so I, I really think that's an exaggeration by people. Uh, They're probably scared of her if, uh, they've, if they've crossed her path and she's given them a club. That's probably what's uh, made them a little scared of her. Douglas, um, how powerful is the position of chairperson? And uh, what do you think? Um, I believe before um, Ellen Zillett was James Selfie, who was the chairperson of the Democratic Alliance. Uh, what do you think? No, of no. no, there are two positions. The chairperson of the party, um, that's Ivan Mayer present. And then chairperson of the federal council and the federal executive. So that, that's the job that Helen's got. Chairperson, federal council, federal executive. Okay. That's the, and James Self was uh, for 23 years, I think. He succeeded me. Uh, and she's, she's the next one uh, in the line. And how, how powerful do you think that position is? Would it be accurate to describe it as being like the secretary general of the ANC? Uh, I think it's more powerful than that. It's uh, it's sort of akin to to the 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 um, Guido Montache in the ANC, even though he's actually the chairman of the whole party. But uh, I, you know, Paul Mashatile, for example, is the acting SG at the moment. I don't uh, I, I don't know how powerful that position is. Uh, Magashula had it. I think it's very powerful, but it's a bit difficult to say. They're different types of parties. At least the, the, one of the big differences is that the DA pays its staff, whereas the ANC doesn't. Mm. <laughs> they should, but they don't. Yeah. They don't pay the pensions over, and they don't pay the tax over, and they don't seem to get hauled before the criminal court, mm -hmm. as I would be if I didn't pay my staff's uh, amounts over. But, okay, but uh, what was it like being an ambassador? It was four, four, I was ambassador to four countries in Southeast Asia, and uh, it was fascinating. Although we were stationed in Bangkok, I used to uh, visit each of the other countries. We had no money to do much there, but I used to visit the, the other three countries, um, uh, you know, a couple of times a year. It uh, was very interesting. 
and and what is it like being an ambassador representing an ANC government? Um, I think Tony Leon had pretty much a similar situation, um, uh, being an ambassador, South African ambassador to, I believe it was Argentina. And he was also during the same period you were ambassador to these four uh, the, the countries in Southeast Asia. What what is it like being representing an ANC government? The, I wasn't representing an ANC government. I was representing South Africa. There's a big difference. It. Uh, <laughs> I was the first um, opposition MP appointed as an ambassador from 1994 onwards. So when they approached me, uh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, the, uh, the Director General of the uh, Department of then Foreign Affairs, he phoned me while I was in the car. Hi, it's uh, Ayanda here. Um, the President's asked me to phone you and find out if you're prepared to uh, represent uh, South Africa um, as an ambassador. And I said, Ayanda, do you know who you're talking to? Uh, he said, of course I do. I said, but the president wouldn't appoint me as an ambassador. He hates my guts. And uh, he laughed and uh, said, no, no, he knows what he's doing. And so do I. And I don't want to mention the country. They asked me to go to a different country. And uh, anyway, that was, uh, that was kept quiet for about five minutes. Um, I, I consulted um, my leader, um, that was Helen Ziller by that stage. I talked to Tony Leon and I contacted my successor as Chief Whip and asked what they thought. And they all told me to, to go ahead. So I went back and agreed to accept posting to this particular country, uh, much closer to South Africa, but not in Africa. Um, and uh, then the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs phoned a little while, a couple of days later, and said, look, it's all on track. But Mbeki says we can do better for you than that. Um, how, would you, how would you react to, to going to Bangkok? And uh, because there they also have the uh, United Nations e Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, the 60 countries that belong. So I was going to be the permanent observer there, together with the, the other countries. And uh, so we took that, and really it was a wonderful experience. Um, I kept on reminding myself that I was born in Germiston, and uh, I didn't come from plush surroundings. And then once all the official car and the flag and all of that was over, I'd still be the boyki from Germiston. Yeah? Um, the interesting thing is that ambassadors are called Your Excellency. Yeah? Now, the first time I was called Your Excellency, I sort of looked over at my shoulder to see who was there. About a week later, I was thinking to myself, hell, you know, I don't know why, all these years in Parliament, They've never recognised how excellent I was. You become used to uh, used to the bowing and scraping, but uh, I've always believed uh, in in my pol uh, political life that everybody is entitled to their dignity, and whether it's the cabinet minister or a, um, an ambassador or the person who cleans the bathroom. They're, they're equal in terms of needing to have their humanity and their dignity recognized. I found it very nice to be an ambassador. Um, we worked very hard, um, my wife and I, because being the first from my party to be an ambassador, I have sort of felt I really had to prove that we were up to it. And before I went, as uh, soon as the Carter Osmal let the cat out of the bag at a cocktail party. You know, he liked to talk. And uh, he, he told the, some people and then the media that I was going to be appointed as an ambassador. And uh, um, I was then able to say, when it was properly confirmed, 
that it said a lot for the president and for Minister and Korsasana Tlamini Zuma uh, that they were prepared to trust uh, a loyal DA man and a strong Hill and Zilla supporter as an ambassador for South Africa and trust me to do the job properly. Um, I didn't want anybody to think that I had joined the ANC in order to get a job, which is, you know, what sometimes what people do. Uh, I found the transition to being an ambassador was, was very interesting. Instead of having to look for all the problems and the faults and the negatives and all of that, uh, I thought it was wonderful to be able to stress all the positives about our country. The beautiful weather, the wonderful people that we have, uh, kind-hearted, uh, generally happy people who are nice to each other. The politicians are all lousy to each other in Parliament and elsewhere. But, uh, you know, most South Africans, whether they're black or white or whatever, uh, get on quite well and treat each other reasonably decently. Um, I was very uh, focused on developing trade, uh, particularly our wine industry and uh, selling lots of good South African wine in, uh, in Thailand. Um, and then also uh, travel because, because tourism is really the most important generator of jobs for our country. Um, I, I look at the current Minister of Tourism, uh, Lindy Wesesulu, I see they're referring to her in the Hogarth column in the Sunday Times as Her Royal Highness, uh, because she seems to have an entitlement or think she's got an entitlement to become the president of this country. Instead, she's running around undermining uh, President Ramaphosa and the, her cabinet uh, colleagues instead of focusing on tourism. Uh, I saw there was a big tourism conference. Her deputy was talking there while she was going to talk to Sasko or somewhere. I might be doing her an injustice. Perhaps she was ill or something else. But the Minister of Tourism is not focusing on the, the most important uh, creator of jobs for our country mm. and bringing in a foreign exchange. Um, while I was an ambassador, that's one of the things I really tried very hard to do. And we found, my wife and I, that it was uh, very interesting to see the reaction of other ambassadors, because it was always a topic of conversation that I'd been an opposition politician in South Africa. And I cannot tell you how many times people said to me, um, that their country was not nearly as adult as ours and would never dream of appointing the chief whip of the opposition as, a, as an ambassador. So it was, a, it, it was a plus, not a minus. And the fact that it seemed to be a success was borne out when there were several other appointments, one of which was uh, uh, Sandra Buerta um, from... Uh, uh, who was appointed to Prague, and uh, Sheila Kamara, who went to Bulgaria, uh, Tony and Michal uh, um, came to visit us in Bangkok, and we didn't take leave for that period, we just took, took a couple of weekends, and uh, he accompanied me to uh, all sorts of things, uh, cocktail parties that I was hosting, uh, uh, public meetings, university lectures, and a whole day of filming the life of an ambassador and so on. And uh, at the end of the time, um, where he sort of poo-pooed the idea of being an ambassador before that and saying, oh, horrible job, uh, he said, you know, I think I could do this. And when he came back to South Africa, um, somehow or another, the president um, uh, heard that he might consider and uh, he was duly appointed and was a very successful ambassador and I think that that uh, was the case with all of us the all four um, as soon as the, the the final term was up uh, I think Tony was the last one 
Um, that was the, there were no more. The uh, new Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs or um, International Relations and Cooperation uh, didn't like the idea, I think, of having DA people in important posts. And I think that's a pity because it was a plus for South Africa and not a minus. Douglas, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. And um, as an ambassador during that time, I, be, I believe you just you mentioned Dr. Kosasana Lamini Zuma to a certain mm. degree as the Minister of International Relations. You reported to her. What what is your opinion of her? Because once again, she's now running to be the leader, the president of the ANC. What is your opinion yeah. of this person? Well, I've got a biased opinion in that uh, she's showed such good sense in appointing me as an ambassador. <laughs> you see, it shows she's got uh, good taste and good judgment. Now, I've, I've known her uh, since 1994. Um, we entered Parliament together and uh, we, always got on, we always got on well. And uh, I'll, I'll save some of the anecdotes for uh, for my autobiography or whatever, but uh, we we had a, a very happy and friendly relationship, um, and despite the fact that uh, for a couple of years I was the foreign affairs spokesperson of the party and given the job of uh, of keeping her on her toes, but uh, she showed that uh, if you knew what you were talking about and you talked sense, then she was prepared to listen. I found her charming, uh, intelligent, uh, good conversationist, and uh, somebody I liked very much. And that's probably contrary to what, what many people in South Africa would say. Yeah, that's interesting because, um, yeah, like many people in South Africa would say, she is a member of the RET faction and that... She is in bed with the former president and uh, corruption is going to get far worse under her tenure. But I mean, she was the Minister of International Relations under Thabo Mbeki. She was the Minister of Health under um, Nelson Mandela. I mean, and it, it, there was no clear indication that she was corrupt. So it's, I, I don't really think she's as bad as people like to betray her or yeah. as, as part of a faction as people like to betray her. Yeah. Look, when she was standing last time against Ramaphosa, I said that she'd made a cardinal mistake by becoming uh, associated in the public mind with the RET faction and with her former husband. People did not see her as an independent voice of a strong woman who was capable of doing the job. And uh, I was eventually quite surprised that she came within 179 votes out of 4,000 cost uh, of, of being the president of the country. So at the time, I certainly thought that Ramaphosa was a better choice. As far as uh, it's, she's concerned now, I suspect that she's too old. Uh, you know, we, we seem to go in for very old leaders. I mean, when, when uh, Pam and I came back from Bangkok, um, I was 70, and that was in 20, uh, 2012. And I said, I'm not going back to Parliament, although they've asked me to. I'm not going back into practice as an attorney. I've had enough of clients, uh, and I'm not taking another diplomatic posting. I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing interesting things uh, and appropriate things. Because I think you've got to know when to get out. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying she's she's over bottle, and uh, when you see the president of the United States is is he 79 going on 80? Uh, I suppose it's okay. okay. But in a young country like South Africa, I really think it's time that the baton was passed to younger people, and it says a lot about the ANC that they seem to have so few people of, uh, of class. You know, when you look at the people uh, that uh, were produced by the ANC Youth League, I mean, <laughs> hey, starting with Julios, and, uh, and uh, you can go, go through all of them. They're, except Lamola, who seems quite a good guy. 
Um, I really think that uh, there's something wrong with the ANC Youth League and they're not producing leaders who are capable of, of taking over. Um, you mentioned La Mola. Do you think he is potentially the next president, or at least in this conference, the vice president? I think that's the title, the vice president? Deputy, uh, deputy, deputy president. De deputy president yeah. of the ANC. Because I think people seem to forget that he was Julius Malema's deputy when he was the leader of the ANC Youth League for the president. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think he's going to beat Masha Tila. But uh, who knows the machinations? I mean, that party is riven into different factions. They all hate each other. They all knife each other. And uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I just can't, uh, I can't guess who's going to get in. Now, uh, Julius Malema has said that uh, the EFF is prepared to go into coalition with the ANC uh, if uh, Mashatile is the new president. And uh, of course, he's, he's stirring and trying to cause trouble. Is it, isn't but, it, uh, sorry, Douglas, isn't it uh, Guidi Mantasha or is it Mashatile who he prefers? No, I think it's Mashatile. Okay. He said uh, if, if, he's, uh, if he's the boss, the EFF will go into, into coalition with the ANC. I think South Africa had better be aware that uh, they, they need to support opposition parties, not, not the EFF, um, because the, the more votes the DA gets, the less votes the ANC is going to get. It's as simple as that. And if you want a new South Africa, a new beginning for South Africa, and some uh, you know, people to attack, the, the really attack the corruption, uh, then, then what you need to do is to have a change of government in a constitutional democracy, it's absurd to have a government in power for 30 years, which is what it will be by then. It's just no good because those politicians start thinking they've got a divine right coming straight from heaven to, to be the boss. And then you get people who say, I didn't struggle uh, to be poor. It's my turn. We must now eat from the trough and so on. Uh, I like governments that, that change frequently uh, every couple of terms so that the government goes into opposition, gets rid of the crooks, the bandwagon jumpers, the, uh, the people who are not there for the right ideological reasons, gets rid of those and comes up with new policies that are appropriate for the 21st century. The current government has got policies which uh, were designed in Europe uh, in, what, 1890 or something, and were quite popular in East Germany uh, in, <laughs> you, you, you can tell me when, even before I was born, that's saying something. And those are the policies that, uh, that they like and try to apply. And that's why our economy is in such a mess and everything else is in such a mess, because they... <laughs> They don't, uh, they don't look to this young, vibrant country, which is the, the mineral treasure, treasure house of the world. And yet we're just getting poorer and poorer and poorer. Such a shame. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. On that point, uh, uh, communism is not just perhaps wrong, it's outdated. I mean, it's based on helping the workers, but... I mean, a recent study out of the United States shows that something like 90% of the workforce will be automated by 2030. So you're, you're basing all of these policies on helping the workers. But I mean, robots, um, AI, all of this is going to take over. So mm -hmm. communism isn't really relevant in today's modern age anymore. Well, you know, they, they say it's, it's based on helping the workers. But uh, have a look at the, the communist countries. Which, which, which ones, which of them had, uh, had uh, trade unions that were powerful and operated? None. None. They, they were all, uh, they, where they existed, they did what the government told them. Who was free in, in the communist countries, in East Germany, uh, in, in China, in, in Russia, 
Um, you, go, you can go right through them. Who was free? Where was the freedom of speech? Where was the rule of law? Um, and if, if you take all that into account and you think that a whole lot of people in the current cabinet are, are still in love with the communist idea, I mean, it's, it gives you the explanation as to why nothing works here. There it is. Absolutely. Douglas, one last question. Parliament decorum. Um, obviously, during your period, I believe Parliament decorum was in a much better state than it is today with some parties now involved like the economic freedom fighters. What is your opinion of just the general state of handling things in Parliament today? It's, it seems like 75% of the time they're just arguing over whether I should withdraw that statement or not. Yeah. Look, um, people who are in Parliament now, and that's not only DA people, tell me that the whole thing has deteriorated because everybody thinks they've got to hate everybody else. And you know that sitting on the ANC benches there, they will hate each other as well because they're in different factions. So in, instead of uh, treating each other as respectable, responsible representatives who are entitled to have their own opinion um, and, and to express it, uh, people treat them as though they are pariahs and that, it, that anything goes. I think the speaker is an inappropriate choice. She's actually a very nice woman. I know her. She's a kind, motherly person. And uh, you know, I've known her for 30 years. But uh, she's not appropriate to keep the EFF in order. And they somehow think that the way they carry on is attractive to the voters. Now, it might attract a small section of the voters. But the interesting thing is that in every by-election, uh, with one or two exceptions, the EFF ends up getting about the same votes as it did last time. Every poll shows that they're about 10, 11% and, and not, not growing. And I think one of the reasons for that is that ordinary, decent South Africans, hardworking people, don't appreciate uh, um, the, their representatives carrying on like like gangsters and like yahoos who, who, who don't know how to behave. I don't think people like that. And uh, so I'm hoping that when we get to 2024, um, there'll be a, a, a spring cleaning of quite a lot of people out of parliament and replacement by, with people who are prepared to respect each other. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I also think Julius Malema is quite unpopular in terms of um, opinion polling. He's not a very popular opposition leader. I mean, it's a sort of this, um, it's, it's marketed that he's so uh, popular amongst black mm. people that, that clearly isn't really the case. He's, no. uh, it's, it's strange. Well, it's not strange. I've just explained why. Uh, because people don't approve of bad behavior. You know, most, most, of, most South Africans, whether whichever cultural group, language group, wherever, um, we do know how to behave and we've got good manners. Um, in order to get a contrary opinion across, all you need to do, should need to do, is to respect the other side's right to differ with you if they wish and respect your own right to, to express your opinion. And that's what Parliament's about. Parliament is supposed to be there for a rational debate, rational discussion in the interests of the whole country. And at the moment, I think it's falling far short of that. And uh, I really regret that. Having been there before, uh, before 1994, I was there for a few years, uh, and then a, a large period, there were 17 years, in total. Also the provincial, in provincial government, um, I served for 16 years in the Transvaal Provincial Council and five years in the town council and uh, we treated each other decently and I want to appeal to the politicians of South Africa of all parties to try to remember that we're all South Africans, that we're all equal in terms of the constitution 
and we're entitled to our dignity and to be respected. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a powerful message. What I mean with strange is just uh, it's not reflected in the media. I understand uh, entirely your position, but it's strange that it's um, it seems like the media is like a love fest with Julius Malema. Um, but yeah, Douglas, I see our time has run out. I, I really want to thank you for this conversation. This has been amazing. I want to give you one last opportunity if you want to say something or just answer a question that you'd hope I'd ask you. Yeah, all I would like to say is that many people want to leave our country. I don't want to leave our country. I'm here for the long haul. I'm hoping to be around for about another 20 years or so. And I'm going to continue contributing to trying to make South Africa a better place for all its people. And uh, I really hope that uh, younger South Africans will see that there is a bright future if we grab it and make it happen. Thank you, Douglas. Um, yeah, to echo Leon Schreiber's point, he pointed out that um, all the young people left Zimbabwe. That's one of the reasons why Zimbabwe is in such a state. Um, but thank you so much for your time. This has been so interesting to our viewers. You definitely enjoy this content. Show your appreciation by liking this video, sharing this widely as possible, and subscribing to our channel. My name is Donald. You've been watching Worldview.